I saw that post on Instagram that you uh, posted, but there's between 22 and 44 veterans that take their life every single day. I, I knew that it was a serious condition, but when I saw the numbers, that's a staggering number. Have you had the trip to Washington and you had conversations with different, you know, political figures? And if so, like what's been the nature of the conversation and the feedback? We talk a lot about the therapeutic nature of, of healing veterans on the back end, but I mean, I'm assuming with the rate of suicide and the way that veterans have trouble acclimating to society post-war. There's a systemic problem way before yep. you come back into society. I mean, what is that? Are they not preparing you, right, yeah. to go into these zones? Are they not debriefing you correctly? Is the funding not there? Like, what's systemically wrong that leads up to this? Hey everyone, welcome to our Sunday night edition of the Trade of Black podcast. Thanks for checking in. I'm your host, Shad Dales. As we've said all week, we are geared up and heading to Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. this week. Staggering stat that I actually read online this week, that as many as 22 to 44 veterans commit suicide every single day. So needless to say, we need drug reform and we need it now, which is why the topic of conversation today that we're going to have on, he's a former Navy pilot and chairman of No Fallen Heroes. Matthew Wiz Buckley back to the podcast. Good to see you. How are things? Oh, what's up, my brother? I'm living the dream. How's it going, Chad? It is good. Anthony Varel, good to see you. How are you enjoying the weekend? How's it going, guys? Good. Yeah, it's good so far. I saw that post on Instagram that you uh, posted, but there's between 22 and 44 veterans that take their life every single day. I, I knew that it was a serious condition, but when I saw the numbers, that's a staggering number. And I know you've like, you know, you have this, uh, uh, a charity foundation for uh, no fallen heroes. And I wanted to learn a little bit more about that, but you know, one of yeah. the reasons, as I said, off the top, we're going to Washington this week and mm -hmm. there's a lot of topic of conversation that we want to discuss, but have you had the trip to Washington and you had conversations with different, you know, political figures? And if so, like what's been the nature of the conversation and the feedback? Uh, I'll answer your, that the second question first with very frustrating, but let me get back real quick to the, the 22 to 44 a day. So, uh, first of all, that's a shooting. That is a mass shooting every day in the veteran community. I don't mm -hmm. even want to say this, but God forbid 22 to 44 children yeah, were being yeah. gunned down in schools daily. I mean, even the, even the gun nuts would be like, holy shit, we got to do something. So when you frame it like that, mm -hmm. it's a mass shooting on a daily basis. It really hits home. And then you... You know, we, we give this range, 22 to 44. That's kind of a big range, isn't it? Well, let me explain this. So, you know, leave it to Uncle Sam. Any sort of data on suicide with veterans, the lag time is three years. Don't ask me why. Okay. You know, uh, Uncle Sam dragging their feet. So the government number two, three years ago was 22, okay. which, is, which is staggering. Couple small, small colleges, right? Duke University and the University of Alabama. They decided to dig into Uncle Sam's numbers and they found out that Uncle Sam was only counting violent suicides. Staff Sergeant goes in the VA parking lot and puts a bullet in his head. Uh uh. So they dug into the government numbers and it turns out when they talk to family and friends, they're like, no, 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 that guy drank himself to death. Yeah. Or she overdosed. She was a drug That's addict because of her service. She died because of drugs. So that's why they came out and said, eh, this is closer to 44 a day. Wow. And Uncle Sam ain't going to have a press conference that says, hey, we just heard it's actually doubled to 44. They kind of buried all that stuff. So mm -hmm. it it breaks my heart to have it give a range, right? Uh, as a veteran, one, one veteran a day taking their yeah. own lives is too many, let alone this. So I wanted to wanted to clear up why there's a why there's a range. Um, second question: uh, Been to the swamp, and it is a swamp, man. You 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 land in D.C. Yeah. You can feel it, man. These people, it's a self licking ice cream cone. So the the advocacy I've done in D.C. is pretty interesting. I'll never forget. Uh, we were meeting in front of the Rayburn Building to go meet with lawmakers. I get out of an Uber. And my veteran buddies are standing, you know, near the doors and I get out of the Uber to go walk to, to shake their hands and give them hugs out of the Rayburn building comes a Ukrainian two-star general. 
Okay. With a bunch of bunch of folks flanking him. And he walks past us and, you know, they get in some black suburbans and stuff like that. We all looked at each other and I nailed it. I'm like, you know what? I'll bet you one of us is leaving today with some money. Um, so wow. we, uh, because one yeah. of the Congress, and, and I'm not going to use names, uh, mainly we were talking to Republicans okay? because the Democrats are already there. You know, I saw a headline last year that said AOC and Matt Gates, and I stopped reading because I'm like, what, did they kill each other and get into a fist fight? Then I decided yeah. to look at it and it said, agree that veterans should be able to, you know, have access to psychedelic assisted therapy. I'm like, okay, good. So mainly when I in uh, when I'm in DC, I'm talking to the Republicans because their drugs are bad. Just say no. Is uh, isn't this stuff recreational like weed and stuff like that? We we can break that down a little bit more. But let me tell you about the one uh, guy. So behind closed doors, um, talking to this congressman, and we had just this was last year. Joe Biden had just announced 31 M1 Abrams tanks being sent to Ukraine, um, and I'm like, I look at this guy. And I go, hey, man, for the price of one M1 Abrams tank we're sending to Ukraine, you could heal potentially hundreds of thousands of veterans suffering from PTS or TBI. And that guy got angry. Really? Wiz, don't, you, you don't talk like that to, to an appropriator. He's a money guy. He's like, you, you don't talk like that to an appropriator. That's a national security pot of money. What you're talking about is over here. I'm like, well, and I... I throttled up. I'm like, who are you talking to, dude? When you take that money out of my paycheck, that's that's coming out of my paycheck. You might look at it at different pots of money, but outside of this two mile radius, we look at it as one. And let me tell you something, Congressman, it is a national security issue because I have two boys. Yeah. They grew up watching their dad as a Navy fighter pilot. They had yeah. their little flight suits. They, they were on track to be fighter pilots. They wanted to father and their dad, follow in their dad's footsteps. I successfully steered both of them away from serving this country. The number one recruitment source for the United States military for all time has been us, has been veterans. Yeah. I know hundreds, probably thousands of veterans. I don't know a single one who wants their children to go in the military. So I told that guy this. I'm like, you can't, we can't hit our recruiting goals, dude. We're lowering, you don't even need a high school degree, a GED. We're letting drug addicts, we're letting illegal immigrants in. I mean, dude. You ain't hitting recruiting goals because yeah. of this. And it was interesting because that still didn't kind of make this guy, you know, pay attention a little bit. But the lady that was with me, uh, she was a former Marine. She had the number. She's like, she kind of grabbed her note sheet. She's like, well, you know, I forget how many. Well, the VA spends, you know, $10 billion a year on traumatic brain injury and PTSD treatment. You know, if we help, if we use these medicines to heal, we'd save X amount. And he's like, okay. All right, now you're talking. I'm like, you really? son of a bitch. You didn't give about a shit about the suicide, but you cared about the money. Yeah. So very long yeah. answer to your short question, dude. Be, be, bright, be ready to take a couple showers throughout the day because it's it's gross. It's disgusting. Um, it sucked, dude. I was not I was not prepared for the shittiness of it. And another guy who shall remain nameless behind closed doors, I gave him my pitch. He said, Wiz, I love it, man. I love it. You're going to. He kind of looked around. He's like, you're going to have a problem with uh, with big pharma and the, and the tobacco and alcohol lobby. I'm like, I'm going to have a problem. Isn't that your job, dude? Right. I ain't going to have a problem. Yeah. Why don't you, you? It was so I'm even getting animated, man, because I'm back in these conversations. It sucked. So prepare for, you know, put your put your hip waders on because you're going into the swamp. <laughs> so, I mean, we, we talk a lot about the therapeutic nature of of healing veterans on the back end yeah. but i mean i'm assuming with the rate of suicide and the way that veterans have have trouble acclimating to society post war yeah. there's a systemic problem way before you come back into society yeah i mean what is that are they not preparing you right yeah. to go to these to go into these zones are they not debriefing you correctly is the funding not there? Like what's systemically wrong? Anthony, that's a great, that leads up to this. Bro, you nailed it. So you're ready for this. The United States military does a phenomenal job of training us to do some horrible things to another human yeah. being. When they're done with you, they do a pretty shitty job of transitioning you back to being a human. No kidding. Um, okay. Good, uh, good Tom Cruise movie, not Maverick. Good Tom Cruise movie was uh, minority report. 
He worked yeah. in the Department of Pre-Crime. We need the Department of Pre-Suicide, man. Yeah. We need to catch these guys and girls before they're at the end of their rope. So to your point, Anthony, the transition process, leaving the military, you know, it, I'm sure it's gotten better. But my days, yeah. it was like, hey, man, here's how you write a resume. And, you know, there's there's the door. It's like, what? So we don't do a good job. If I could manifest today on this podcast, I'd say I'd love the No Fallen Heroes Foundation or somebody to be able to talk to veterans as they're getting out and say, hey, this is this stuff is potentially available uh, to you. And, and you know, Shad introduced me as the chairman of the No Fallen Heroes Foundation. Let me get this out to the world. I don't want to be doing this. Yeah. My mission objective is to work myself out of a job. They need to be doing this. Why aren't we, yeah. why aren't we, you know, we do a good job prepping the battlefield. Why don't we prep the battlefield for them going back to civilian life? And again, they, it's so sad to say, but they chew through you, man. I mean, when you're done, you're done. Let me give you a quick example. How much time do you, how much time do you have with these guys? Like, are you on the clock? <clears throat> oh God. Yeah, man. It's, they shuffle you in. You got to have your, you know, by the end of the day, after hitting them all, I'm, I'm wired, man. I got my pitch. I, I got, I know after feeling and vibing with some of them, who, what's going to resonate with some, it's a whole, and then walking the, I, I get the term now, walking the halls of Congress and then just seeing everybody yeah. schlepping around. It's like adult Halloween people. Everybody's got their bags and they're going from office to office trying to, and, and begging for stuff. And it just, it, it, it sucks, man. It doesn't resonate with me. And it's interesting because I talk to people at the VA and they're like, whiz, you know, yeah, man, you got to talk to the, you got to talk to Congress, man. We're all about this. We'd love to help you. Then I talk to the Congress folks and they're like, you need to, you know, get the VA on board with this. I'm like, yeah, what is this? A circular firing squad? Yeah. You guys even like <clears throat> <laughs> just avoiding it. It's like every opportunity at any excuse to try to avoid the situation or question. Right. Correct. I yeah, can't, but believe- it is. It, you know, yeah, and you guys know this, the, uh, the definition of a schedule one drug in this country is no therapeutic use and a high risk of addiction. That's the actual definition of a cigarette and alcohol. Yeah. 100% legal. And then me with these, you know, the, the Ibogaine, the five MEO that I did with Marcus Luttrell uh, was without a doubt the most therapeutic experience of my life. And these medicines are anti-addictive. There's never been an overdose with them. And you know, before I went and did uh, Ibogaine in Mexico, I'll admit it, man, I was a drinker. And I don't know if you can be a good drinker. Uh, I was a drinker. Uh, up to eight months after the Ibogaine, I couldn't even smell or look at alcohol. It made me wretch. So talk about the opioid crisis in this country. 100,000 yeah. Americans, <clears throat> Kentucky and a bunch of states are starting to look at it like, wait a minute, Ibogaine can reset somebody's system they 85 percent of heroin addicts up to three years after one ibogaine treatment can't even don't even look at heroin again what are we doing yeah so it, it's interesting that these guys will look at me and say oh you're gonna have a you know big pharma and the alcohol and tobacco lobby i'm like what are you doing here that ain't my yeah. concern or responsibility lead follower get out of the way dude i know <laughs> so- I can't believe that stat when you do it. Like you're talking 14 to 15,000 veterans per year that are dying of suicide. Correct. And I, so you ready? I, I told you the data lag three years. What happened in 2021? We yeah. surrendered a 20 year war against terror to the people we started the war with. Yeah. My phone blew up. I bet. I bet the suicide around the Afghanistan debacle yeah. spiked. I know it spiked. I, uh, I'm, I see it on my phone and, oh, did you hear so-and-so? I'm like, oh, my God. I mean, guys are like, why did I blow up? Why my why is my buddy dead? Why do I have horrific tinnitus? Why did I do all that time in Afghanistan to lose and then to watch the surrender, the pullout on on TV? And, and then 13 guys and gals at Abbey Gate get vaporized by a bomber? Oh, my God, dude. So... I'm waiting for the next wow. round. I'm waiting for the next round of veteran suicide numbers. And I don't even want to, it's, it, it's, it's, uh, it's going to suck. So, so even the horrific bad. things that veterans go through, even if the ones that say, don't even see a scratch, you serve a purpose for 15, 20 years. And then that's just basically taken away. And it's like, who am I? What's the purpose that I'm serving? Mm-hmm. And it's almost like, oh my gosh, like I've just, dedicated 15 years of my life, my life in this case, we use that term broadly. Yeah. And yeah. 
a lot of people would say it's all for naught, you know? Well, and, and so to Anthony's point, to transition to the wearing civilian clothes, you lose your sense of mission. I bet. And you're ready for this. You guys know this. I left a fighter squadron where you trusted the guys and gals in that fighter squadron with your life or they weren't part of that organization. And where did I go? I went to Wall Street, man. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I went to the Chicago Board of Trade. So a fighter squadron where you trust somebody with your life to a Wall Street atmosphere where you, I couldn't trust a guy to watch my wallet when I went to the bathroom for five minutes. I mean, these guys would push their own mother in front of a bus to make a dollar. So I went from having a, an awesome mission and trust and honor to wearing golf cleats to work so I could step on top of people to make it up a ladder uh, and, and just make money. It felt that's where I kind of spiraled. I, you know, I, I kind of entered the JFK junior uh, on the way down. So you lose that, that sense of, of mission when you transition out as well. How did a lot of people view you on wall street? Cause anytime that you see a veteran that obviously uh, served and, you know, I don't know how many, how many years was it? You were in the, uh, 15, 15 yeah, years. 15. How'd they view you? You know, was it, uh, open arms or was it challenging? What was it like? So I got, I got hired into a wall street firm. I went and did like a consulting gig as a motivational speaker to a volatility arbitrage firm. Interesting. In the board of, yeah. in the board of trade, they're like, uh, and, and the, the briefing call before the event, they're like, oh, well, we're a volatility arbitrage firm and we trade options and options are, I'm like, I know what options are. I have a strangle on Google right now. I'm selling calls against my Amazon position and blah, blah, blah. They're like, oh my God. So when I went and did this, this speech with them and I laid on what I did as a fighter pilot and how I applied to business, they're like, they called me that Monday morning. They're like, here's a check for an obscene amount of money you'll never see in your life. You're moving to Chicago. And I did. So it was pretty wow. cool. It was pretty cool to apply everything I learned as a fighter pilot. I bet. Yeah. To to trading in the business world and have them look at me like I was the smartest guy in the world. I'm like, wait a minute, you're not doing this? Like debriefing, for example, something would go wrong and they're like, okay, well that, that sucked. Let's, you know, go on to the next thing. Here's a perfect example. My first week there, they were, we were having problem getting quotes from the Phil uh, to the traders and, you know, lost a couple million bucks. They're like, whiz, can you look into this? I'm like, yeah, we're going to debrief. They're like, what? I'm like, Okay, I got the seven tech directors in the boardroom after the market closed. And I got up and I said, okay, who's responsible for getting quotes from the Philex to this trading floor? And you could hear like crickets chirping. I'm like, okay. <laughs> and, you know, there was there's some Ukrainian and, you know, Chinese, all these tech guys, these booger eaters. I'm like, all right, maybe it's a language issue. I'm like, who is responsible for getting quotes from Philex to the... And finally, some guy finally is like, well... You know, I kind of do this and she does that. And then he, I'm like, everybody shut up. Who's got 51% of the vote? Who's got, whose throat is going to get choked or back is going to get padded as a result of the success or failure of this? And they're like, uh, so just even, you know, I call it a spa, single point of accountability. Commanding officer of an aircraft carrier, man, he or she can be sleeping, eating in the reactor room or on a treadmill. If that ship runs aground, she or he's fired right? There's one person accountable. So that's just a, an example of how, or, or red teaming, right? Before I went flying on a mission, uh, if you, the three of us were planning to go drop some bombs in Syria today, yeah, we'd plan. And before we walked out to our airplanes, I'd say, stop, let's go get two, three buddies who weren't involved in our mission. They're not going flying with us, but they have situational awareness. I'd bring them in. I'd sit them down and say, here's what we're going to do today. And I'd brief them on it. They don't say a word. And then once I get done briefing, I go, what do you got? And then you can hear the shotgun go, Ch -ch -ch, and they just start, they become the enemy. Do you think about this? Yeah. Did you think about that? Look at that missile envelope. What if you run out of gas here? And boom, 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 boom. We actually call it a murder board because you're not allowed to say anything <clears throat> because the human nature in me would be what, oh yeah, we thought about that, you idiot. No, we didn't. But so you don't say a word other than thanks. And you just write down all the red team, you know, comments. And then I use the popcorn rule when there's like three to five seconds between them, you know, throwing knives at us. And they're like, all right, you need a haircut and shine your boots too. I know they're done. Then I'll get rid of them. When the door closes, then we can bad mouth them. But no, we go through the red team comments and man in the military or the business world, I've never done a red team exercise that hasn't made my plan at least like 30% better. 
So mm-hmm. doing something I'm like that. Use, I'm going to use that moving forward. Yeah. Yeah. So long answer to your short question, Chad, how did they view me? This was base. This shit was like breathing to me as a fighter pilot. I bet. But bringing these concepts to Wall Street, they're like, oh my God, this guy's the, the coolest thing since sliced bread. I'm like, I'm robbing a village somewhere of an idiot. The fact that you guys aren't doing this stuff every day, you're making money in spite of yourselves. So after a couple of years, like tightening up this system and having accountability and debriefing and planning and stuff like that, that thing turned into a well-oiled uh, death star. Yeah. So, you know, most veterans, if they transition and then, and, and they can kind of take the rank off and, and keep some of the good stuff yeah. are viewed, are viewed pretty well in businesses, but there are other people, man, uh, if they hold on to the military stuff too tight, they can't transition. I remember mm. a couple of times people would kick open my office door and like, whiz, whiz. I'm like, Did, is anybody dead? And they're like, what? I'm like, is anybody dead? And they're like, no, we're just having a problem. I'm like, then relax, dude. <laughs> yeah. In my old life, somebody kicking open my door like that, somebody is dead. So throttle back, man. We're going to go get a beer after the market closes. Whatever you're about to tell me, if nobody's dead, is okay. So even just that type That's of- That's a great example of the small little things that we take for granted. Correct, man. Right? I'm telling you, people are like, people went from <clears throat> kicking my door open to knowing like, okay, Wiz ain't gonna, I'm like, everybody just take a deep breath. We're getting to go yeah. home tonight to our loved ones. Where I come from, some guys and gals didn't get to go home yeah. uh, after the trading day to their loved ones. So some vets can't make that, that transition. And then that's tough, right? Because they really love this job and they're, they're, they're taking their military ethos into it. And they look at their buddy next to them like, dude, I don't give a shit, you know, throttle back your work. You're making us look bad. Yeah. And that kind of a veteran can get very lonely with that. I was kind of smart enough to chameleon and, and know how to deal, but there are some veterans that can't, that can't do that. Yeah. I'm assuming there aren't very many organizations that teach veterans how to take their expertise from combat and from the military and deploy it into a business setting. Anthony, um, this is kind of like you have. This is going to suck. I'm not going to mention any names, but there is a whole veteran subculture of guys on LinkedIn like, hey, for X amount of bucks, come to my veteran transition thing and I'll, yeah. you know it's a cottage industry. Um, sure. To answer your long question is there isn't a gold standard of like somebody doing it. There's a lot of, yeah. there's a lot of crap of. It's almost like a bunch of like grifters and like guys trying to sell courses and like shit like that. Yeah. Nailed it. Because it seems like the practices that you were implementing there. I mean, those could be applied to tech, to anything, anything. Correct. Um, to, 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 to anything. That's what I tell people. I'm like, you know, taking this trading firm from 99 people and about 150 million when I showed up to 3 billion and 600 people wasn't me. It was the processes and procedures. So you're so right. You, you implemented a lot of that stuff, correct? Oh, God. Yeah. 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 How long when did I show take from 150, 150 million to 3 billion over what time, time frame are we talking? I was two and a half to three years. Yeah. Wow. It took it. So, and it was just me with all these people. So, systems, they were a system. They reduce. They resist change. Systems resist change. You push on something, yeah. you take the pressure off, it goes back to it. You got to push to make that change. So when I showed up there, it was the two husband and wife that owned the, the firm, some partners, and then everybody, tech, finance, trading. I kind of made like a joint chief of staff. I made, you know, generals, so to speak, in charge of things. I mean, I broke it out into a, this thing turned into a, a cool thing, but that took, that took a while and a lot of buy-in, right? Because a lot of people are like, dude, I'm a volatility arbitrage trader. What's this Hornet guy going to tell me about anything? Yeah. To Anthony's, to Anthony's point, this my language translated, whether you're selling widgets, building Boeing products, yeah. or trading, you know, buying and selling arbitrage call options, man, it th- these things are universal. And like wow. I said, to me, it was as natural as breathing. But to some people, you know, I thought it was common sense. And as you guys know, that common sense ain't that common sometimes. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I know even from what I, well, I won't get into it, but the whole idea, <laughs> if you kind of like what you do now, if you can imply some of the stuff that you did in the past and mm-hmm. carry that information and experience into your new profession, yeah. uh, it's amazing if you can focus on one thing and do it really well, how far you can get ahead in life just by taking Amen. a chance, right? Correct. But, yeah. uh, Anthony, 
uh, that was a great explanation as far as discipline, something that you possess when it comes to trading as well. But that takes it to a whole new level, don't you think? Yeah, abs- uh, absolutely. I mean, I'm more fascinated on the red team uh, exercise. Yeah. To, uh, you know, it's funny, uh, man. In, uh, and, and, and there's people, you, you guys have seen this in the corporate world or trading world. There's people that are like a walking red team. All they love to do is criticize yeah. stuff. So we act- I would actually make red team hats and we had like a roving red team. These people actually loved kind of being on the red team. And here's what's cool about the red team process is like the three of us, we planned our mission over Syria. They red teamed it. We got airborne. Those three people that did the red team, they actually, they're invested in our flight now, aren't they? Or this initial. Oh, yeah, yeah. When we land, they're going to be like, hey, man, how'd that go? So the red team actually helps create buy-in. These people are like, I took part in that. I made it better. So the red team process actually helps the, yeah. the, to glue things up a little bit. So it, it, uh-huh. it's, I mean, that's what I, that, that, that's what I more liked about the venture capital space. I mean, getting on a call, getting, a, getting on with founders and going through decks. It's not how good is this business? It's how can I tear it apart? Yeah, man. And where are the holes and where are the vulnerabilities? And then yeah. after addressing those, how can we make it better yeah. and enhance it on the back end? Wait, well, what I tell people is I'm like, if you don't red team your plan, who's going to do yeah. it for you? Yeah. yeah the right. enemy. The competition. Yeah. So why wouldn't you do it? And they'll gladly red team your plan for you, man. So why yeah, wouldn't yeah. you do that before you get airborne? Yeah. I mean, the whole, I went to Top Gun and, and the whole concept of Top Gun is that's the red team. If we go anywhere in the world and we're surprised by an enemy or their capability, we fail, yeah. man. Like my, yeah. you know, my, this thing on the wall over here with 44 combat sorties over Iraq, they were without a doubt the most boring flying I've ever done. The most challenging flying I ever did was over the skies of Nevada, <laughs> getting ripped apart by Top Gun po- instructors and you know weapon systems. I'm like, holy shit! So we should go anywhere in the world, and it should be kind of a letdown if we're surprised. We we failed. Can I ask you something? You probably get asked this once a day. What's the craziest, most entertaining Top Gun story you could share with us? Oh my god, Top Gun or or flying fighters? I I got some. Flying fighters. Flying fighters. Oh, man. I almost killed myself. I, well, you? you know, um, that, that shouldn't shock you two guys. But uh, <laughs> so I'm a 28-year-old kid, 27, 28-year-old kid. I'm an instructor pilot down at Miramar in San Diego. I'm teaching kids how to fly the F-18. So I'm a senior pilot in the squadron, which means I'm also a maintenance pilot. Anytime they do maintenance on a jet or we do an acceptance, like a brand new jet comes from the factory, a senior pilot like me needs to go out and put it through its paces before you, you let the kids fly it, right? So, man, I'll never forget this day until the day I die. Hey, Wiz, we got an acceptance flight. I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm in, man. Acceptance flight. This jet flew from St. Louis, Boeing, it was McDonnell Douglas, uh, to Miramar, like two hours on this jet, man. I walk out on the on the flight line and this jet sitting there, man, it was the hottest thing I've ever seen in my life. Because if, you, <laughs> if you've ever seen an F-18, it's got like a, a fuel tank hanging from it. It's got pylons yeah. where we hang bombs. So this jet had just gotten here. So it's what we call slick. This thing was as slick as holy crap. And it was just, it was, it was a siren. It was a mermaid on the rocks calling me, man. So I get out. It was a brand new jet. Brand new motors, these uh, EPE, the Enhanced Performance Engine Motors. I get out on the, the runway, pointing west towards the Pacific, man. And I go to full afterburner and I like, I fly out of the back of the airplane, man. I'm like hanging on the, the stabilizer because this thing is fucking zipping. So I get airborne, you know, take off, go over La Jolla, Del Mar, and now I'm out over the, the restricted areas. And I, after seven minutes, I knew this jet was flawless. Okay. I'm a 27 year old lieutenant with a bag of gas. I'm like, hmm, <laughs> <laughs> I, I got some time. So the, the F 18 flight manual says the service ceiling is 50,000 feet. And I'm looking up there. Beautiful day. Not a cloud in the sky, Southern California. I'm like, oh, voice. <laughs> Let's go check this out. So full afterburner. I unload the nose to, to get some speed. I hit about Mach 1, you know, I'm supersonic. And I start pulling back on the stick and I'm, I'm accelerating going up 25,000, 30,000. I mean, it's just, I'm zipping, man, 40,000, 45,000, 50,000. I'm like, what am I going to explode or something like that? Nope. This thing keeps zipping. 
I get up to about, I see 60,000 feet on the altimeter, man. Curvature of the earth. Seriously. You, yeah. You can see some dark and you see the big blue marble, man. Then the earth's round for all you flat earthers. So I'm looking at black and, and I'm like, holy shit, man. That's at 60,000 feet. 60, yeah, I'll, I'll tell you how I got the exact number, but it was like 61,350. How do I know? I'll tell you shortly. So wow. I'm a political science major from South Jersey. I forgot that there's no air at 61,000 feet. So the motors start chugging. They're like, boom, boom. They start coughing. I'm like, oh shit, I better, I need to head down. So I'm like, I got my altitude record. Let's go for speed. <laughs> so I just kind of roll this thing upside down. And I point straight down at the Pacific and I leave the afterburners engaged. I am fucking hauling ass straight down at the Pacific. How the fuck did you not pass out? No, that's, I'm like, it's like sitting here and just, I'm humming, man. Really? Well, wow. But good question, Anthony. Here's what happens I get, I hit Mach 1.8 ish. That's 13, 1400 miles an hour going straight down. So at about 25,000 feet, this political science major from South Jersey goes, I should probably start pulling out of this dive. Yeah. So I pull the throttles to idle and it's like I hit a wall. I mean, the deceleration, I'm like, oh boy. And I pull back on the stick. And then the F-18 and all these electric jets, now you're a voting member. You don't, if I pulled back like that in a cable jet, you know. So I pull back on the stick and the flight controls say, huh. We're hauling ass right now. If we actually do what Wiz is commanding, the jet's going to like disintegrate. So we're not going to give him that. It just gently starts a little bit of a pullout. And I'm like, oh my God, I do some quick mental math and I'm going to, I'm like, I'm going to fly right into the Pacific. Can't eject at this point because I'm, I would have vaporized. I, you'd go from yeah. no wind to 1400 miles an hour of wind, you know? You just, you'd vaporize or your arms so would be. What, what's going through your mind right now? Are you, are you nervous? Or are you? <laughs> so I, I, you know, I have to tell my beautiful bride, you guys met Susie. I'm like, uh, I, of course I was thinking about my beautiful bride. I didn't have kids at that point, but here's what I was really concerned on. I'm like, those son of a bitches, my buddies are going to be officers club later making fun of me. Like whiz flew a freaking brand new jet into the Pacific. What an idiot as they're like, totally yeah. Funny. <laughs> That's all I cared about, man, was looking like an idiot to my buddies. Um, so now I'm getting into the teens, and now mm -hmm. there's air, and now the jet's starting to dig. So to oh. Anthony's point, man, I turn into a cotton ball. I mean, I'm just a cloud of vapor as I am jet shaking. I'm pulling G's, and I'm like, oh, my God. And now I'm starting to wonder, like, what it's going to feel like to hit the water and what the sensations are going to be like. And, man, I shit you not. And we have, like, we have – some mirrors on the canopy bow. I shit you not, ma'am. I bottomed out just under a hundred feet and there's a big rooster tail of water behind me and I climb out of it. A <laughs> hundred feet. I'll give you the exact number in a couple minutes there, Anthony. Are you serious? Yeah. You ready? So here's what, yeah. So I'm flying back to Miramar, man. I got like a lucky strike cigarette, you know, I'm smoking. I'm like, Holy <laughs> shit. So I'm flying back, man. I land at Miramar. And I walk through the maintenance department and the chief's like, Hey, sir, how's the jet? I just, I just kept walking. I didn't even say anything to him because I knew what yeah. was going to happen. You know, I go up to my office and I got like a, you know, an emergency bottle of Captain Morgan in my desk. And I'm just like, I'm hanging because I knew what was going to happen 20 minutes later. Hey, Wiz, the commanding officer wants to see. You. I'm like, of course he does. I'm assuming, I'm assuming there's flight record, um, there's avionics and flight recording software that basically recorded all of this. The jet's a yeah. tattletale. <laughs> the jet's yeah. a tattletale. So, yeah. it, it, you know, the maintenance uh, department got all that stuff data linked to their laptop. And, uh, man, I, I, I ripped the wings off of this aircraft. So I go, this was a Marine squadron. I'm a Navy guy. I'm a visitor in yeah. this squadron. And I'm at attention in front of this commanding officer. Now, I had done some pretty good things in my naval career. So I had some, I had a couple get out of jail free uh, cards and I had to use all of them, but that guy's like, Did you scare yourself? I'm like, really? Yes, sir. He's like, you ever going to do that again? I'm like, no, sir. He's like, get the fuck out of my office. So I didn't fly. I had to put my uniform on and like sit the duty for like a week. But, uh, after could I you probably see, out, the, could you see the look on your face? Like, but to ask a question like that, knowing that you oh, probably we talked about it, we <clears> laughed <throat> about it years later, man, because here's what happened. 
they had to fly a crew from McDonnell Douglas to Miramar to x-ray the wings. <laughs> so, and it sucked because oh, wow. this was a brand new jet. It was stuck in the hangar until this team got out there. So every time I went to go flying, I'd walk by that jet and kind of turn my head. I felt so bad because the maintenance guys were stealing parts off that airplane to fix all the other ones. So this, wow. this jet, this beautiful new airplane was like cannibalized to serve all the other aircraft. I felt like shit. But anyway. How much are those? What's the price tag on one of those F-18s? That one was 65 million bucks. Wow. So nice. this team from McDonnell Douglas gets out there and they, you know, they're, the guy pulled me aside, came up to my office. He's like, he's a civilian. He's like, Wiz, we're not supposed to tell you any of this shit, but you broke the F-18 altitude record. Look at the readout right here, like 61,350 feet. And then he's like, our data stopped recording under 50. I'm no like, kidding. he's like, it probably, you probably bottomed out in 30, 40 feet above the Pacific. I'm like, oh my That's God. That's crazy. So. <laughs> 30 to 40 <laughs> feet. Yeah. So, ladies and gentlemen, your your tax dollars at work, man. I almost killed me. Survived flying over Iraq and landing aboard the aircraft carrier at night in bad weather, and that, that's me. So That's amazing. <laughs> what, well, I got my money's worth when I asked for a great story. That pretty much tossed it off, buddy. Dude, you got to have me back, man, because it, it, I don't know if they get better or worse. It depends on your point of view from there. So, 15 years in the Navy – uh, then went and spent 10 years on wall street, grew a business from 150 million to 3 billion, and then decided to start your own company. You have a tra uh, trading options school right now. And I know you've built a database of close to 200,000 subscribers. Um, so clearly this is working. What are some key questions that I guess you navigate through your investors through, like in addition to some of the structure that you've already outlined to us, because uh, I think our audience would find this interesting is more retail investors are not really looking at financial advisors anymore. They're looking yeah. for online content, but it's a, a very tricky world out there as to who to trust and why. But mm -hmm. uh, those are just some great examples. But what are some common things that people ask and the success yeah. that you're building? Guys, I got to tell you the number one, you guys, I'm preaching the choir with you guys, but you have to have a trade plan. So I had a, yeah. a plan to fly over Iraq. As you guys know, 90%, maybe even more of trading is emotional, right? How many times have you talked to a retail trader like, hey, I'm up this much money in this position. I'm like, when are you getting out of it? Uh, I'm up this much money in it. I'm like, uh-uh. Before you got into that trade, you needed to know when you're getting out for maximum profit or you're ejecting for minimum loss. When is it? Uh, or, you know, a retail traders in a trade and they're like, and they're down. It's going yeah. against them. And they're like, oh, it, uh, uh, it'll come back. I'm like, dude, Apple doesn't know who you are. It would steamroll over your house. What are you talking about? So I, I helped, you know, take the emotion out of the trading. I, you know, I, I sit here, here's most of my trades, man. I, I have like, if I don't do Excel sheets or Word documents. There's something about picking up a pen, engaging the pen and going, I have a seven step trade plan. Before I shoot a missile or drop a bomb in combat, or I place a trade with real capital, I take my pen and I write down when I'm getting in, when I'm getting out, max profit, min loss, what my max risk is. Why? Because in a week, two weeks or whenever, I'll come back and look at this and go, hey, it hit my profit target out. No, hey, I could squeeze more out of it. Pigs get slaughtered. Also, yeah. the loss point. Because I look at my own handwriting three weeks later and go, hey, Wiz, you said you'd get out of this if it hit this. Now, if I decide at that point to stay in the trade, I'm the pilot in command. I sign for my jet. I make the decision as a commanding officer. Like, you know what? I'm going to overrule what I said three weeks ago. And here's my lucky strike. And, you know, let's see what happens. Right. So most most retail traders don't do any of this shit, man. Right. They, they wake up in the morning. They, they have their cup of coffee, put on their bunny slippers, watch. Jim Cramer froth at the mouth and, and they don't have a, a plan to trade. So that's number one. And then number two, like you guys are going to DC and you know, near and dear to my heart is the only space I am bullish on for the rest of my existence is the psychedelic space. Yeah. These names, as you guys saw last week with a tie and we've seen Cybit yeah. and MindMed and Compass, these names are set to explode. And this ain't some cheesy dude at the water cool at work giving you a stock tip. I'm, I've lived it. I am living it. I've done yeah. uh, these medicines. So I've seen, uh, I, I know what's coming. Um, and, yeah. and this is where 
Uh, you guys know I'm all in. I'm a big investor in Healing Realty Trust. It's uh, there's no infrastructure. You can't. Yeah. Let, let's let's be positive. When not if when MDMA is legal for therapeutic use this summer, you ain't going to your doctor's office to do your MDMA journey on you know a examining room table with wax paper and a National Geographic from 1980. It's going to have to be a big room with a couch and two chairs for observers. It's going to be videoed. There has to be a bathroom. That infrastructure doesn't exist. So we have a REIT that we've launched to build this infrastructure. Um, Daniel Carcillo, my, my, my buddy, two-time Stanley Cup champ, we were opening clinics in Oregon where it's legal on a state level. We have a company called My Crew Doses. You met those fellas out in uh, psychedelic science where we're you know yep. doing healing supplements. So yep. I am all in on this space. So you can go chase AI, you can go chase fads and stuff like that. This ain't a fad. You guys saw psychedelic science, 10, 15,000 Republican governors, veterans, hippies, uh, NFL players, all in a yeah. big room, all aligned to the same mission. This is, I'm, I was about to say, this is coming. It ain't coming. It's here. So yeah. That's, if I was well, a retail trader, that's what I'd be looking into. Yeah. Like, look, psychedelics is medical, the research, the quality of life, everything that's going on research-wise, the difference between that and cannabis. Uh, cannabis, I think, is definitely veering towards more of a CPG industry. But from a trader's perspective, these two industries do uh, captivate the retail investor audience. But, you know, Anthony and I, we've talked a lot, extreme volatility regarding these two sectors, but it really makes a lot of sense. Um, so if people want to learn more about your approach and just the school itself, where can they find information? Yeah, topkinoptions.com. Uh, and then if you scroll down, you can uh, you can get access to my daily sit rep. Uh, situation report. So I give a, you know, I do a five, 10 minute video each day uh, as part of my briefing process. And, and that's just a, a free video. And that would be a good gateway drug to, uh, to see what I do at TGO. We have a, we have a portfolio dedicated to trading psychedelics. We have a portfolio dedicated to just trading Amazon. I call Amazon of uh, the death star. It's literally the only stock you need to own the rest of your life. Oh, you need to diversify. Uh, their air division is bigger than UPS and FedEx. Their inter Amazon Prime is bigger than Netflix. AWS, Amazon Web Services, is Microsoft. Yeah. So owning Amazon stock, you're diversified in and of itself. So yeah. we have different portfolios that uh, that are skill based. But real quick, before I forget, when you guys go to uh, to DC, try and hitch or rehitch the the marijuana wagon to the psychedelics. Like you and okay. I, have, yeah, you, you, the three of us have talked offline. I know. So some of those Republican congressmen are like, oh, this, this is kind of like weed and it's uh, you know, recreational. I'm like, dude, I got my ass kicked for 12 to 14 hours on Ibogaine. Yeah. You're not doing Ibogaine and going out and, and doing anything. It's therapeutic. No. So make sure you try and re yeah. you, you hitch the wagons back together. One thing I wanted to bring up, too, is that you mentioned that not about if, but when MDMA gets approved, there was a uh, piece that came out from a nonprofit company called ICER earlier this yeah. week, and it was talking about the credibility of the uh, research and trials that MAPS did. And I know we talked a little bit about this the other day uh, off camera, but for those that I guess were questioning, you know, was this backed by Big Pharma? Is there some truth to it? What was your response when you read it? Follow the money. Unfortunately, yeah. whenever it comes to anything in this space now, I, I have to say, uh, follow the money. I read the whole ICER report, 108 pages. Uh, I got to be honest, fellas, I have a problem with a report that says, we talked to secondhand sources. I'm, wait, what a minute? It's secondhand? Yeah. Okay, so I'm not even going to, I have to discount those. And then firsthand sources. I'm like, okay, well, let me get into this. And to retain their anonymity, I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. This country yeah. for the past six to eight years has ri been ripped apart in the media with, quote, anonymous sources. So I, I like a good red team. I think the ICER report tight, you know, pokes some holes in some areas they can tighten up. But some of that, fellas, I got to tell you, read a little uh, high schoolish. Okay. And I'm going to be I'm going to unzip my fly a little bit um, because ICER is a nonprofit. It's it's an independent yeah. nonprofit. I'm going to tell you in the veteran uh, nonprofit space, there are alleged veteran nonprofits that are anything but. And we're a space that's supposed to be honor and integrity and everything. So if, if, if I kind of raise my eyebrow at some folks running around in my industry, you're going to tell me that a 
nonprofit. Yeah. That's aligned with the insurance industry is, is, is full of popes and priests that are absolute, you know, come on, man, pull this leg and it plays jingle bells. So, you know, I, I talked to you guys know uh, Melissa Lavrasani at the psychedelic medicine yeah. coalition. So I picked her brain. She was like, Hey, ICER's a, it's a legit. And th- this is the FDA can't ignore this, but I can't believe, you know, write down the date and time that I'm about to say this. I'm actually so happy that this FDA is Joe Biden's because <laughs> If it was maybe a Trump FDA right now, drugs are bad, anything's yeah. bad, drugs, their FDA might be like, well, look at this report and we're not going to approve it. The fact that Joe Biden's FDA is probably stacked with a bunch of people that are like, because they already gave the new drug application priority review. Yeah. And they're like, yeah. hey, Which man, cool. put it in this inbox and, and we're going to, yeah. you know, make, you see that word puppy? Make it small dog. Okay, good. Now you're good to go. So, uh, I don't know if it's lethal or fatal, but it definitely raises Interesting. a little bit yeah. of concern to me. Glad you uh, shed some light there. This is the TDR Trade of Black podcast. I'm Shad Dales on with Anthony Varell and our guest here this evening, Matthew Wiz Buckley. Leave some comments below. As usual, YouTube loves to pick up these videos that go viral. If you leave lots of comments and lots of engagement and let us know if you think Matthew Wiz Buckley should be on regularly talking about options trading. And if you find that very helpful to your trading thesis, but this has been great. Uh, we started out some important information and stats to obviously touch on the current suicide rate in the U S your background, obviously, uh, in the Navy segueing into uh, wall street and some of the, uh, you know, revenue growth that you had that's now segued into who you are today teaching a trading school as well, chairman of a nonprofit organization and a great family. One of your sons, I think, was at, was it Colorado uh, this yeah. past year? Let's go Buffs, man. My, my middle son, Jack. <laughs> yeah, out there with Coach Prime. What was that like with uh, Coach Prime? But that that was a rock concert uh, all season. Um, you ready for this? So we flew the family out to see Jack for Parents Weekend. Okay. They played Stanford. I think we were up. 28 to nothing at halftime. And my kids were like, this is boring. Let's go. I'm like, I, I wouldn't go anywhere. Stanford yeah. came back and ended up winning that game in like overtime. Oh, <laughs> you could, you could hear a pin drop. I was like, this is the most insane thing I've ever seen. So, you know, man, not the weekend uh, uh, college game day was there. It was, Pat, it was Pat, dude, everybody. Yeah. They, Rock, yeah. Pat McAfee. That was a hell of a show that day. I, I, it, it was a circus out there. And it's interesting because I just saw a stat like uh, CU Boulder has seen a 60% increase in applications. They have like X amount of tens of thousands of new applicants. And so I looked at Jack, I'm like, good thing you snuck in <laughs> the, the year before all this shit happened. They're going to win a national championship in five years there. From your from your mouth to God's uh, ears, man, I agree with that. The way he's, he's recruiting and chaining, cha- like Nick Saban's gone now, and there's a new era of college football. It's about to begin, and uh, I don't want to I don't want to rain on anyone's parade, but I will bet both of you <laughs> that Deion Sanders that Deion oh. Sanders is coaching in the SEC before he wins a national championship. Wow, you think you he's heard of the SEC? From- I don't think he's that. I don't. I, he's always been. Stepping effort. stones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I've been to Boulder. Boulder's beautiful. Yeah. I mean, that campus is amazing. But prime time, and not to pun, but prime time football is the SEC, ACC, yeah. Michigan. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think he leaves. I, I think he's done great. He's an FSU guy, guy too. You, you could, I could see him at FSU, you know? So... So I thought the same thing, but if you notice in his pressers, he doesn't say that he went to FSU. He always mentions the HBCU that he went to point. before yeah. Interesting. Tallahassee. Otherwise, I would be on that train. I right. thought he was for what sure. What a legacy, though. Going like, to come to, uh, to FSU. Yes, LSU is in the SEC, but really wasn't a powerhouse before Nick Saban basically won a national championship there. And then Alabama took it to a whole new level. Yeah. But what a legacy he would leave behind if he did win a national championship in Colorado, then took a job at the SEC. But I don't think if, if, if he doesn't win more than four, what he won last year, he, he he's gone. Yeah. So yeah, mm-hmm. he needs, this is, he's under the and microscope. I think an SEC, I think an SEC school, Auburn, LSU, not Alabama, but I mean, one of those schools would be like, Dion, 
Come on yeah. down. And he get him recruiting in the South. Yeah. Yeah. Look at all these guys. I mean, Chip Kelly, like I'm not going anywhere. You know, he left that morning yeah. on a jet, you know, type of thing. These, these guys, it's, it's all about the money. And I know was it was, a, it, of, was it Texas uh, or Texas A&M 15, that was going after 15, 15, Texas A&M is, uh, that's Jimbo. Wait, no, Jimbo. Who was going no, after Dan? So, who was going after Dan Campbell? Was it Texas or Texas A&M? I think it was Texas, wasn't it? Texas. He shut it down, basically said uh, I'm not leaving the Lions, but what a story. That yeah, was. I mean, the NFL is the, the grail, but I mean, if you tell a college coach, hey, I'm going to pay you $10 million a year, by the way, here's a $50 million NIL fund, Yeah, go sign and pay whoever you want. Yeah. I mean, it's that's the bit, that's Texas, Texas A&M, LSU oh, yeah. football. Friday Night Lights. Yeah. yeah. Wiz, listen, yeah. I really oh, appreciate yeah. uh, you checking in here today. Uh, incredible yeah, human being. Uh, helps out people from all facets of life. And uh, we really appreciate it. And uh, most importantly, hope to continue having these conversations with you. And uh, I think a lot of our audience will find a lot of great value to some of the hey, feedback hey, that you had. Today. I appreciate it, guys. Before I forget, if, if you're a veteran, uh, a first responder, a family member, or you know anybody who, who who's, who's in, in a bad place, Shoot me an email, man. Wiz, W-H-I-Z at No Fallen Heroes. Uh, we give healing grants to, to, to those in need. So if I'm, I'm here to tell you as, an, as a vet, healing is possible, man. There, there is a way out. Yep. So if you know anybody who's hurting, please reach out to me. I, I, I'm 24-7, man. I, nice. You know, when I, I love this saying, and I think it really exemplifies who you are. It's nice to be important, but it's more important to be nice. <laughs> That's you, man. man. Listen, appreciate man. your time, and uh, let's get in touch. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Take care. Thanks, guys. What's up, everyone? So what'd you think of the interview? Are there any more questions you want us to ask that you want to learn more of? Then leave a comment below and let us know what you think. As usual, share this video with your network, smash that like button, and most importantly, subscribe to our channel because we would not be here without you. Thanks for watching, everyone.